Question number one. What is the purpose of periosteum in bones? A, it aids in bone formation and mobility of the bones. B, it aids in bone repair by providing blood supply and assisting in osteocyte formation. C, it covers the end of long bones and protects the area from blunt force. Or D, periosteum is one thin layer covering the entire bone and supplies blood vessels as well as nerves for the entire bone. So our answer here is B, it aids in bone repair by providing blood supply and assisting in osteocyte formation. Your periosteum is a membrane, a thin membrane that covers the bones except for the joint regions where ligaments and tendons attach to. It is made up of two layers. The periosteum's outer layer has both nerves and blood vessels. The nerves communicate any type of pain, so if your bones have a fracture or any trauma done to them, the nerve is going to communicate to your brain, hey, there is pain here, there's a problem here, it needs repairing. Blood vessels are going to obviously supply blood, and this carries rich oxygen and nutrients to the blood so that it can repair itself and it can regenerate some osteocytes. The inner layer of the periosteum is called the cambrium and this contains osteoblasts. Osteoblasts synthesize and mineralize the bone. They create the hard part of our bone. Now they are most active and we have the most osteoblasts during adolescence and childhood. This is when we are at our peak of bone formation, right? But as we get older, we have less and less osteoblasts. That's why in the elderly, if they have a bone fracture or break, it's going to be even harder for them to repair that bone because they have less osteoblasts. Also, if you're wondering, osteoblasts and osteocyte, those are not the same thing. Osteoblasts generate new bone cells, and osteocytes are already mature bone cells that maintain bone tissue. Question number two. The following is true of the epididymis. A, the epididymis is the erectile organ that is used to transport sperm. B, it is the site of sperm maturation. C, the site of sperm production. Or D, the epididymis secretes buffers and fluid that lubricates the penis. So our answer here is B. The epididymis is the site of sperm maturation. The epididymis is a coiled tube that's roughly 20 feet long and it lies on the surface of the testicles inside of the scrotal sac. Sperm cells are stored here until they become mature enough to swim or to become what we call motile. Alrighty, question number three, my friends. Which part of the nephron is closest to the collecting duct? A, loop of Henle, B, Bowman's capsule, C, distal convoluted tubule, or D, the glomerulus? Our answer here is C, the distal convoluted tubule. So I know that it kind of seems that everything is in close proximity to each other um, because everything's kind of squished up, but if you follow the flow of blood in the renal system, then you'll know that the distal convoluted tubule 
is the closest to the collecting duct and on the right hand side i have gotten this image off of the internet but i triple quadruple checked that it is the correct pathway of blood flow through the kidneys so you can use this as a reference um Again, it's in gray, it's uh, the pathway of the blood. It starts at the renal artery and it ends here on the interlobal vein. And if you're looking for the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule, I've uh, put that image at the top left-hand side. Question number four, which of the following are not part of the endocrine system? A, pituitary gland, B, pineal gland, C, adrenal glands, or D, lacrimal glands. Our answer here is gonna be D, lacrimal glands. So the endocrine system includes glands that secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. As opposed to the endocrine system, there's the exocrine system, and these glands secrete products outside of the body. So here listed pituitary gland, pineal gland, and adrenal gland, these are all part of the endocrine system. These hormones, I'm sorry, these glands secrete hormones directly into the blood system. And D, lacrimal gland, <clears throat> excuse me, lacrimal gland is actually, uh, it produces tears, and tears, they go outside of the body, correct? So the lacrimal gland is part of the exocrine system. And just as reference, uh, the lacrimal gland is directly above the eyeball. So it's that squishy thing that you see um, between the eyebrow and the eyeball. Question number five, which of the following are needed for prothrombin to convert into thrombin? A, vitamin K, B, vitamin B, C, vitamin D, or D, vitamin C? Our answer here is vitamin K. Prothrombin along with vitamin K help convert into thrombin and thrombin is a clotting factor. It helps to coagulate the blood and create a clot for any kind of wound healing. Just wanted to mention a little side note here. Vitamin K is going to be very relevant to nursing because it has such a strong impact by clotting and coagulating the blood. This can potentially cause things like embolisms, um, strokes, cardiovascular complications in a patient who has already um, some sort of disease or, or problem with their blood already. In a normal functioning person, it's a good thing to have blood clot because you will not bleed out when you have a wound. So just wanted to mention this, vitamin K is a must know and when you hear vitamin K, it probably is going to have something to do with blood clotting. Question number six, which layers of blood vessels are made of smooth muscle? A. Tunica media, B. Lumen, C. Endothelium, or D. Tunica externa. Our answer here is A, tunica media. So most blood vessels have three layers. The outermost layer is your tunica externa. And I normally remember this by remembering like externa, external. 
So tunica externa supports and protects the vessel. It's a fibrous tissue. The middle layer is called the tunica media, and this is elastic tissue and muscle and collagen. So you can see um, both of these images provide the tunica externa, the tunica media, and lastly, the innermost layer is your tunica interna. And I remember interna as internal, like the innermost layer. So the tunica interna is a smooth thin layer of epithelial cells. And other than that, you have your lumen, which is the inside hollow area of your uh, blood vessels. Going back to your tunica media, that's made out of muscle this layer helps control the diameter of your blood vessels so it causes vasodilation or vasoconstriction vasodilation we know that the blood vessels relax the muscles relax and the diameter of the blood vessel gets wider gets bigger and vasoconstriction is when the muscle um it constricts, it gets tighter, and it closes up the blood vessel and the diameter becomes smaller. Question number seven. In which section of the pharynx are the adenoids located? A, nasopharynx, B, laryngopharynx, C, oropharynx, or D, larynx? So our answer here is going to be A, nasal pharynx. Your adenoids are referring to this large lymphatic tissue that is in the back of your nose and throat, and it's also known as your famous tonsils. The bottom left-hand picture shows exactly where these adenoids are located, and your bottom right-hand picture actually shows tonsil stones. So this is kind of not that common, but it can happen, and I thought I'd post a picture because it looks really disgusting and cool. So this gunk can develop when your tonsils become overworked and they're overburdened with so much bacteria and chaos, they will leak these disgusting, smelly stones. So let's talk about why the other answers are not correct. So first off, the top of your throat starts off with a section called the pharynx, and then it moves on to the larynx. So your pharynx divides into three sections. The first section is your nasopharynx, and that's exactly where these adenoids are located. Then it goes on to your oropharynx, which you do have tonsils located in that section, but they are not referred to as your adenoids. And then it moves on to your laryngopharynx, and then it moves on to your next section, which is your larynx. So that's why nasopharynx uh, fits this uh, answer correctly. The whole passageway from your nose and your mouth all the way out, past your stomach, past your intestines, past your anal canal, all the way to the absolute exit, you must, must know this passageway. So make sure you take the time to study this and look at the details of the entire passageway from the entrance to the exit of your body. Question number eight, my friends. Which ion is responsible for causing acidity in the blood? A, hydrogen ion. B, sodium ion. C, bicarbonate ion. Or D, potassium ion. Alrighty, so our answer here is A, hydrogen ion is responsible for causing acidity in our blood. So acid-base balance is important for maintaining homeostasis in our body. And the two main ions or electrolytes, same thing, ion and electrolyte, that balance our acidity and alkalinity in our blood are hydrogen and bicarbonate. So Hydrogen causes acidity in the blood, while bicarbonate does the exact opposite. It causes alkalinity in our blood. 
So both of these ions, hydrogen and bicarbonate, work together to create a balanced pH in your body. So the pH scale is from 1 to 14, 1 to 6.9 being acidic, 7 being neutral, and 7.1 to 14 being alkaline. The normal pH of blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. I'll say that again. The normal pH of blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. Now, if the blood pH becomes lower than 7.35, meaning it's too acidic and meaning it has too many hydrogen ions, too many hydrogen concentration, then this is going to be referred to as metabolic acidosis. Now in contrast, if the pH goes over 7.45, then the blood is too alkaline, meaning the blood has too much bicarbonate, and this is called metabolic alkalosis. So here I have some photos of metabolic alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. Now, to be honest, it's not like you're gonna need this right now um, for the exam, but for future reference, and just in case it may help you remember what um, acidosis and alkalosis is in the blood, Here's a picture of the symptoms of both of them. Question number nine. Which of the following muscles is striated and under voluntary control? A, cardiac muscle, B, skeletal muscle, C, smooth muscle, or D, skeletal and smooth muscle? Our answer here is B, skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is striated, meaning it has these stripes, and also it is under voluntary control. Voluntary control means that we have the control to move it. More specifically, when we move our skeleton, our bones, our muscles move along with it. So when we walk, when we pick something up, when we throw something, we are moving our skeleton, and the skeleton is moving our muscles with it. Let's move on to the next one. There's smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is um, not striated, hence the word smooth. And this is found in blood vessels. It's what causes vasodilation, vasoconstriction. It's also found in the digestive tract. It is the reason we have peristalsis. And peristalsis, we know, is the movement of the food down the digestive tract or the contraction of the smooth muscle that um, moves the food down our digestive tract. Uh, we also have it in the airway of our lungs. The other type of muscle we have is cardiac muscle, and cardiac is referring to the heart, so this type of muscle is found only in the heart. Cardiac muscle is striated, but it is also involuntary. And I don't think I mentioned that about smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is involuntary. Involuntary meaning it acts on its own. We do not um, control its movement. Question number 10. What is the purpose of gyri and sulci in the brain? A. It divides the right and left hemispheres. B. It divides the cerebellum and the cerebrum. C, it increases surface area, or D, it creates a cushion to protect the skull. Our answer here is C, gyri and sulci, they increase surface area on the brain. Let's look at A. It divides the right and left hemisphere. The answer for that is actually the longitudinal fissure. And B divides the cerebellum and the cerebrum. The answer to that is the transverse fissure. Now, D creates a cushion to protect the skull. Absolutely, the, the gyri and the sulci, they do provide a protection for the skull. However, their main and most important role is to increase surface area on the brain. So remember what I said about even though there's multiple correct answers, always pick the most correct answer, the most important. Question number 11. Which layer of the skin has hair bulbs 
nerve endings, and blood vessels. A, the dermis, B, the epidermis, C, the hypodermis, or D, the subcutaneous layer. So our answer here is A, the dermis. The dermis is the middle layer. It lies between the epidermis and the hypodermis. So the dermis carries hair balls, um, <laughs> hair bulbs, not hair balls, uh, sweat glands, blood vessels. It has lymphatic vessels, um, sweat glands. So it has a ton of things. Right above the dermis is the epidermis and this is known to be the waterproof barrier and protector. It's the protective layer of our skin. Right below the dermis is your hypodermis. Like I said, this is also referred to as your subcutaneous layer. This is mostly made out of adipose, adipose tissue, and which is fat, and some connective tissue. Eventually, you'll be very familiar with the subcutaneous layer because a lot of injections are given to this site. The reason being is adipose tissue or fat absorbs slowly. It absorbs medication slowly. So certain things like insulin will be given subcutaneously or sub-Q for short. Question number 12. Which of the following nerves is responsible mainly for eye movement? A, trochlear nerve, B, vestibulocochlear nerve, C, glossopharyngeal nerve, or D, hypoglossal nerve. Our answer here is A, trochlear nerve. So in the answers below, I decided to use these four because I feel like these four are the ones that people mainly forget, in my opinion. They're like the hardest to remember. So let's go over these. Vestibulocochlear nerve is your eighth nerve and it's responsible for sensory, hearing, balance, and equilibrium. Glossopharyngeal nerve is your ninth nerve and it's also mixed. It's a motor nerve for tongue and throat muscles, sensory for taste and physiology. Some cranial nerves are mainly sensory nerves providing input. Some are mainly motor nerves providing output directing activity. And then there are some that are mixed. Either way, you gotta remember all 12 of these. Alrighty, my friends, almost to the end. Question number 13. Which of the following hormones increase metabolic rate, influences both mental and physical activity, and are required for normal growth? A. Thyroxin and tritothyronin, B. Epinephrine, C. Insulin, or D. TSH. Our answer here is A, thyroxin and tritothyronin, also known as T3 and T4. We know that both of these hormones are produced and excreted by the thyroid gland, which you can see here. It's right in the middle of the neck. Let's go over the other answers. Epinephrine. Epinephrine is like your wake-up call. It's going to increase your blood pressure and your heart rate. Insulin is known for lowering glucose levels in the blood, and it does this by promoting glucose uptake into cells, in other words, using glucose in the body, and glucose storage. TSH is your thyroid stimulating hormone. Don't get this tripped up with your T3 and T4. This is not produced and secreted by the thyroid itself. It's actually secreted or stimulated by the anterior pituitary gland. So again, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, this stimulates thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones like T3 and T4. Question number 14. Which of the following are in control of the pituitary gland? A, the pineal gland, B, hypothalamus, C, adrenal glands, or D, frontal lobe? Our answer here is B, the hypothalamus. 
Now, the pituitary gland is known as the master gland, or at least the anterior pituitary is known as the master gland. But what controls the pituitary is the hypothalamus. And as you can see from the image, they are very close in proximity. Woohoo! We made it to question 15, guys. Great job. Alrighty, so impulses leaving the AV node and headed to the Purkinje fibers will cross which of the following? A, right and left bundle branches, B, SA node, C, right atrium, or D, the pacemaker. Our answer here is A, the right and left bundle branches. Your SA node is the first to initiate an impulse. In other words, it begins your heartbeat. After this, your right and left atrium contract. At the same time, the impulse travels from your SA node down to your atrial ventricular node. After this, the impulse travels to your atrial ventricular bundle or bundle of his. After this, it travels down your right and left bundle branches. And lastly, it ends up in your Purkinje fibers, which surrounds the bottom of your right and left ventricles. So right here, I have a picture of an EKG or ECG. They're both the same thing, electrocardiogram. And this represents the electrical currency of your heart. Alrighty, guys. So with that being said, thank you so much for being here. I had a lot of fun studying with you guys. And until next time.